Walker, good evening everyone. Welcome in to your box seat, brought to you in association with Woodland Stud. Looking forward to their selections later in the program, as we always do. It's been a very busy time in harness racing, and it's about to get a whole lot busier. Michael Guerin, we have an Australasian champion amongst the juniors. We'll talk to Cherie Tomlinson very shortly, and it's into Dominion time. A very good evening to you. Hello, mate. Uh, big hi to everybody. I hope Wednesday was good for you. We could have a couple more Australasian champions in about two and a half weeks' time, of course. And to Doms, are they still relevant to you? Do you care? I suppose we will, depending on the New Zealand horse's performances, Greg. Also, we catch up with Andrew Seabrook. He's the boss of New Zealand Bloodstock, who now have New Zealand Bloodstock standard bred as their other arm, about some interesting developments about how we're going to sell our horses and what it means for you heading forward to yearling sales time this season and in the seasons ahead, Greg. But we do love winners. Very shortly, we're going to be joined by one in Cherie Tomlinson. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. So we've got a lot to get through. Some silverware coming our way. We talked about the Inter-Dominions, New Zealand bloodstock. Uh, we'll head to the United States, uh, where a Kiwi's doing the business over there, winning a big race over the weekend. We get to see Mick Wicket again. Uh, looking forward to that. Some other achievements. And he's a 12-year-old. Yes, he is. And he's still leading the punting competition. Well, he's right up the top uh, anyway. But we talked about the Australasian Junior Drivers Championship and and we have the champion online out of her base, out of Mark Jones's uh, uh, lodge there, if you like. And Cherie Tomlinson joins us. Uh, a very good morning to you, Cherie. Congratulations on an outstanding achievement and what has been a whirlwind, uh, what, 12 months and one week, and now you're the Australasian champion. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Yeah, no, I'm back in um, Canterbury now after a great week um, in Australia with um, some great drivers, and yeah, it was a great thrill to um, win the Australasian Juniors Champs. You'd been to Brisbane the year before, I think you finished fifth or sixth uh, that year. Just how much of uh, uh, help was that, being able to go back to the same state and, and ply your trade again? Do you reckon it was an advantage? Yeah, I think it helped a lot. I mean, um, when I heard that it was back in Brisbane, I, I um, thought that it was great uh, going over there last year and getting to go around both Redcliffe and Albion Park, I think helped a lot and, uh, helped a lot. and I think um, also the driving style over there going last year and seeing how they drive in that um, really helped um, for this year's competition. Cherie, it's based over the 10 races. You got off to an absolute flyer and we're having a look now at your three winning drives. Uh, the first of those uh, came with an ex-Kiwi and one off and it was pretty brave, wasn't he? Yeah, definitely. He was a cool wee horse to drive. I mean, it was such a pleasure to drive for Grant Dixon, obviously being one of the top trainers over there. And talking to him before the race, he's just he's just such a top driver, you know. He, he knew how the race would plan out and this and that. And um, yeah, he was a cool horse to drive. And obviously getting the two wins and the placing on the first night was um, a great start to the uh, series. But obviously we still had two more meetings to go and anything could happen. I mean, um, going into the last heat... Um, was still a bit nerve-wracking even though I was out by a few points. We just had a look at goal kicker winning and uh, Springfield Spirit was uh, a narrow victor but I'm picking your favourite track in Australia anyway at the moment might be Redcliffe. Yeah, it is actually, surprisingly considering it's not the nicest track um, to drive around. It's more of a triangular shape but I think I've been there I've driven there three times now for four wins and a couple of placings so I can't really complain about the track. <laughs> You've certainly joined some uh, pretty big names to have won the Australasian Championship and, and Michael uh, I think Cherie thoroughly deserves it because she's come a very long way. You sure have Cherie, congratulations on behalf of all of us in the industry. Just, just explain to us what it's like when you put on the black colours with the silver fern because like everybody I'm sure you've grown up watching the netballers or the rugby or whoever else and you've seen that silver fern. Did you take a moment where you looked in the mirror in the driver's room and thought this is pretty cool? <laughs> I definitely got a few photos in the in the colours that's for sure. I mean um, it was a great honour to put on the um, silver fern colours. I mean there's been a lot of top drivers um, that have driven in those colours, especially obviously Mark Jones going over and winning the World Drivers' Championship in those colours. So, I mean, it means so much to be able to put them on and then obviously um, be able to win in it. It's just amazing. It would seem a vastly different thing driving at Redcliffe and on those Australian smaller tracks than it would a Monte Carrara or an Ashburton or 
Addington. How different did you find it and did you need to think differently or are the horse person's skills pretty much the same? Uh, well, obviously over there the fields are a bit smaller and I mean um, you do have to have the horsepower around um, those tracks there and you've got to have the draw as well. I mean um, you've got to be handy around Redcliffe. It isn't, wasn't really a track that you could come wide on. Um, it, it's more of a front runner's track. I mean it, even when you're sitting in the trail, because um, it's such a short straight, you know, you're, the passing lane sort of needed to come a bit but sort of at the bend sort of thing before the light um, before the straight is sort of the momentum that you had to build up um, to to hit the line um, probably wasn't enough I mean I was lucky enough to win up the line um, uh, once at Redcliffe but yeah the tracks are a lot different and you sort of got to be handy um, turning for home to be a chance of running in the top um, three. Tree was seeing some great photos your family were there uh, mum Amanda and your dad uh, Mark and you had a friend there as well you were able to celebrate with. Yeah, no, mum and dad and my nana um, also come over and yeah, Olivia Shim was there. She had a great time and it was great to share those moments with one of my best friends. So, I mean, yeah, we all had a great time and I think all the other Aussies and stuff enjoyed Olivia's company too. Cherie, people often talk about what it means to get into what bizarrely used to be called the boys' championship and these days, of course, it's not just the boys, it's the boys and girls. Why does it mean so much to you? I'm sure there's not a lot of money involved in it. Why does it mean so much apart from wearing the silver fern, to be part of this? Well, when I was younger, I mean, that's all I really thought about. I just wanted to get to 17 years old and be able to drive on race day. I mean, I used to get such a kick out of um, driving the kids' carts, ponies, and I was always so competitive. I mean, even at my other sports like netball and um, rugby and show riding in there, I mean, I was always competitive and I always wanted to win. And I think um, I could have never seen myself working in an office. I, I hated that. I didn't like school at all either. And I mean, um, I think I'm just such a competitive person and I just love the um, feeling of going out there and um, driving at the races, really. Hold on, hold on. Back up the bus, Cherie. You played rugby. Or, uh, tell me more about this. What position did you play? Oh, <laughs> no, only at high school, that's oh, about all. Okay. I tried to um, follow in mum's footsteps, but I was too much of a wuss. OK. <laughs> so, but, but like, tell us, what, what position did Cherie Tomlinson play at footy? Uh, I, th oh, I was wing, and then I tried to be flanker, but I wasn't much good at that. Oh, OK. Yeah, Fair I have enough. played a little bit of touch football. Just only yeah, a very little bit really. of, with, with, with Cherie. She's had a bit of toe, don't worry about oh. that. She's a bit speedy. Hey, Cherie, do you still feel like a junior driver? Yeah. Because you, you've, had, you've had success, you've won a Dominion, and your profile's pretty high these days, and, and people pitch you on horses in normal races and not just juniors, junior races. Do you still feel like a junior driver, or do you feel like you're now ready to take the next step and, and you're an open driver? No, I still feel like a junior driver. I mean, I've still got um, so, much, so much to learn on and off the track. And um, no, I definitely don't feel like a senior driver yet. I feel like I've, well, I sort of have only just started um, driving on race day. So um, I'm just very lucky to obviously get the opportunities to drive um, such nice horses and um, obviously getting um, drives up and down the South Island most weeks, um, which is great. And I think I'm just fortunate that um, I've got trainers that are willing to put me on on race day. Cherie, there's the first ever tote Monty race in New Zealand at Alexandra Park on Friday night. I'm not sure whether you knew that at all, but have you ever tried riding a trotter under saddle? And is, is that something you would ever consider doing on a race day? Um, no, I didn't know there's a Monty Trot on Friday, but um, yeah, well, I used to, before getting into harness racing, I used to do a lot of show riding and um, I used to ride show ponies for um, Mel Mowbray's mum back in the day and I used to ride an ex um, standard breed called um, Aramid and obviously um, at home I used to dry, uh, ride Zachary Binks before he ran uh, second in the Jules about a couple of weeks before I was riding him up and down the hills just to get his strength up and down south I, um, when I was down there I rode a lot of Craig's um, 
race horses. We would just go out together and he'd be on the GP in front and I'd be in behind galloping away and then we'd pull out and have a race up the straight. So, you know, I've done a lot of riding and I'd love to do some Monty trots. So I think it's great. There you go. She could be yeah. riding in the Monty's. Uh, Cherie, you're up to about 74, 75 wins <laughs> career-wise. Um, I guess the next goal is to get to 100. What other goals have you got because you've kicked so many already? Yeah, my next goal is um, to get to a hundred winners, and um, obviously just to keep um, dri driving and getting um, wins on the board. I'd, I've still got um, I've got this season and two more seasons to go um, as a junior, so I'd love in that time to um, win a junior drivers premiership. That would just be um, be great to do that. And um, yeah, there's al there's always a lot of things that you can um, try to achieve too. And, and racing, obviously, you get to drive a, a few nice horses you know that that would be a great great um goal in the future as well well there you go ask, Michael. ask her the mark caller question go on i know you uh, want to ask okay her. well mark caller's heading north <laughs> have you had that discussion with clint or do you think he'll stay driving uh the horse he part owns of course Oh no, the only discussion we had was when we turned around after the Dominion he said, I'm done, you're going to drive him from now on in and I just thought, oh, I'm not even going to listen to it. Spur of the moment, <laughs> adrenaline running through him, I just sort of went in one ear one, and out the other because I knew it wouldn't happen sort of thing. But um, I think, like, I mean, Clint's doing a great job. Obviously he, he works him every day and he's driving him very well at the moment. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to break, break something that's not broken. Um, that's what I think anyway. Hey Cherie, on behalf of Michael and I and everyone in the industry, congratulations uh, on winning the title over the weekend and uh, you certainly made your family proud and the industry proud as well and uh, you keep on doing what you're doing, you're doing it so well. Yeah, thank you very much guys. Cherie Tomlinson, well... Uh, hard to believe Cherie's got two and a half years, years still to go. Yeah. Because you know, obviously she's a very pleasant girl and she can obviously drive but she seems very mature for her age. Um, I'm glad she gave up rugby, <laughs> because <laughs> it's a tough sport, and particularly at Flanker. Um, I'm not a huge fan of believing that the best drivers always win these series. No, because a lot of luck's involved. Uh, a lot of luck's yeah. involved, in the, and I've seen great drivers finish not last in these series, but I do believe she was the best driver on that series. And she is now at the stage, she's driven in the New Zealand Cup, she's at the stage where if I see her in a race, I don't think, if, like, if I see her in a race in Southland, uh, it's a plus. Yep. In a junior driver's race, it's a double plus. And even if she's out there against you know, Blair and, and all the top drivers in the south, it's not a negative. Whereas for a lot of the junior drivers, you go, well, uh, this person's too inexperienced to be doing this against these guys or girls. That's not the case for her anymore. If she was in a race against the All-Stars, I would not expect her to be intimidated. So that's my highest compliment I can pay her. She's a junior driver who is already mentally in my punting roller decks at a senior driver level. Yeah, and congratulations to Alicia Harrison and also Benjamin Butcher who took part in that series. And uh, yeah, well done it's to It's amazing all. how much it means to people because you sort of think, oh, it's three or four days away from home. But I suppose that a lot of these people make friends who are going to be friends in different states of Australia for the rest of their lives, Greg. Mm. And, and it would be cool to wear the silver fern because most of us are never going to do it. And when you see those shots of Cherie coming down the straight wearing the silver fern. Yeah, pretty cool. Now that's something you could tell your grandkids one day if you're that way inclined. So uh, congratulations. I think it's a great story. Caps a remarkable 13 months, months for her, but an incredible month for the family. Mm. I mean, this is a family, the Ford Tomlinson family, who you always knew about in harness racing. They were always doing things in the background, but they weren't getting to the top of the tree that often because they probably didn't have horses good enough to get there, Greg. Well, yep, but when you hear like Aramid, yeah. Zuri, Amarito, Even Sun, Zachary Mark, Binks. Caller, Zachary Binks. It, I've done it too often, Michael. Exactly. And, and it to, comes to, down to, to those families luck. who can train trotters. Invariably, it stays in the blood, like the Williamsons. Yes. You know, the people who can train trotters can train them. I think it's a great story. It's a feel-good story. And um, it's, it's something that I think all three of those younger drivers will never forget. Yep, absolutely. Uh, thinking of Australia, we need to stick there because it's into Dominion time, of course. And uh, the first in the three-year cycle, which will become six years and could go beyond that as well, uh, is Melbourne this week. Yep, so we start at Melton on Saturday night, then we head to Ballarat Tuesday, so then we head to Cranbourne the following Saturday, then into the finals. So here's the New Zealand pacing team, Cruz Bromac, I'm Pat's Delight, as you'll be known over there, and Spankin. 
And the Trotters, slightly bigger. Uh, Wilma's mate's officially trained by Tim Butt for this series, but clearly she's a New Zealander. Um, speeding Spur, there could be a bit of a driving situation here developing because Speeding Spur, Josh and John Dickey, that's set in stone, but Alderbeck and Monty Python, both Phil Williamson, and Anthony Butt was down to drive them, but he's also now been asked to drive Wilma's mate. So there might need to be a change here somewhere along the line. First heat, Saturday, 22, to, uh, 22 40 mobile. Then we go to the sprints at the Rat, 17 30 mobile. Then 2555 at, uh, at Cranbourne. I think it's good it's going to the regions, Greg. Now, here's the key part, and we can't ignore this. The final is only 500,000 for the Pacers and 150 for the Trotters, and that's the reason many of our best horses aren't there. Does that make the series less relevant to you? Do you care? Will the winners care about the stake? How do you feel about those levels? Well, the trotting level is the biggest anomaly for more. And I, I can handle the, the half a million, and the Inter-Dominion as a series needs to be run. So I can cop that, but I, I don't know about the 150 for the trotters. That's like saying they're a third world country or they're, mm. you know, a long way from where the paces it, it, are. If a, it was 250... Is half I'd, a million good enough, though? If it wants to be relevant... I'd rather have half a million than not have the series. I agree with that. If, but if the New Zealand Cup's 800,000 and, and the Miracle Mile 750, which is basically 800,000 New Zealand, give or take, if it wants to stay relevant as the pinnacle of the sport... Surely it needs to be there or a million. My, my attitude is this. I think that if they hadn't run the Victoria Cup in October and said we're putting that money into the Inter-Dominion final, I think people in the industry would cop it. Yep. They'd go, OK, that's fair. I think, because it goes to Auckland next year. Now, you have to hold the Auckland Cup. It's a grand circuit race, and it's a, it's a far bigger race because, see, Victoria's already said the Victoria Cup's not their biggest race. The Hunter Cup's their biggest, biggest race. race. You can't yeah. drop your biggest race. But if Auckland said we're willing to get rid of a couple of other races, for example, the National Trot, if they said we're not holding the National Trot two weeks later, but that 100 goes into, into the 150 that. and it's 250, would you cop it? What are the rules? Well, that, I would cop what, that. What, what are the rules? The Do rules they are, have to? They have to, the three jurisdictions, which is New Zealand, um, Canterbury and obviously Auckland, um, Melbourne and New South Wales, agreed to not trump each other, so they're going to stay at the same level. So that's the level for three years? That's the level for three years, and, and I think that's not right, because with the Winston Peters potential money coming in to the harness racing industry, we could have easily got to 750. Sydney's the easiest one of the lot. They have two $100,000 qualifiers pre-Miracle Mile, which they don't need. They could run those qualifying races for $10,000 and get and exactly get the, the same, same fields, field. yeah. because they're only qualifiers for the Miracle Mile. That's why people run them. So there's 200 grand you could bump across to an Inter Dominion. I think to remain relevant and to have the luster it deserves, we need 750 for the Pacers and 250 for the Trotters. I agree with you wholeheartedly. This is better than not having that, but I don't think we should have capped it. I think we should have allowed the other jurisdictions to go as high as they can So the go. best thing that could happen now is, that's what it is for three years, but this is what we intend it to be. They should be making an announcement, the editor minion. I don't think you need, harness racing so small, you don't need any rules. If, if by some miracle, Alexandra Park can produce a million next year, well, great, who cares? Let them have it. Let yeah. them have it. So, look, that's what I think, but originally, but talking about the series itself. Let's get into the field. Obviously, we yep. don't have an enormous amount, we don't have a Lazarus, and we don't have an enormous amount of stars because heats are being retired and some aren't going. And, and it's easy to say that the fixer or ultimate machete would be there if it was more money, but they wouldn't be. No. Because they've been on the water walker. I'm not sure how many more Kiwis would have gone at 750. Here's the first of the pacing heats, and this is actually a really interesting race, even if you don't follow Australian harness racing, because we know Spankham and Pat's Delight. Rapper's Delight has been very, very good off the gate, but inside it's my Alpha Rock, another former New Zealander who's fast, and then there's Tiger Tara, who we love, but Greg finished last in the free for all. This is the heat of the night where I'm going to go, wow. Mm. Like that's, these are horses we know, I know them all, but you're even going to know most of them. And if Tiger Tara comes out and crushes them sitting parked, then you go, wow, he's back. Um, if either of the Kiwis can sneak through and win, it's a big deal. I think Rapper's Delight may potentially lead for young Kima Fredding, who's one of the great stories of this Inter Dominion. So that would give a good run through to Pat's Delight? Yeah, because Pat's Delight could get a yeah. good run. So it, it, it's actually a very intriguing heat, and it's going to have a huge impact 
on the markets for the final. The next heat's interesting for a different version because the two big names here are Shadow Sachs, who's the Victorian, and San Carlo, the other Victorian, and they've been winning Pretty Relative, much everything. Relatively yeah. rubbishy three pools. Yeah, but everything that have been on there. Yeah. They've both got the second line. And Franco Nelson, our old mate, who seems like it's been years ago. <laughs> 2014, since he, he finished since he second, ran in the second, second to adore yeah. me. Yeah. Um, he ran fourth in the Victoria Cup. He's got very high gate speed. You're looking there and you're thinking number three, Elmer's Image, Elmer's Image. Why do I know that name? Yeah, it's the same horse. Yes. It's little Elmer's Image. That won the Green Mile. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm. It, it's the same horse. And they just get to Australia and some horses grow another leg and some horses don't. That's interesting to see whether those horses are good enough to sit parked outside Franco Nelson and beat him. Italian delights there and Tim Butt trains that horse now, doesn't he? Yeah, he so, does. Yeah. They send him across and... Uh, look, he's in the series. He's a horse who wouldn't make a normal into Dominion. He's got a bad barrier draw. Then we get to the last heat, which is the most likely Kiwi success of the night. Cruz Bromack, we know, is excellent in the free-for-all, good in the New Zealand Cup. I think he's been outstanding this season, Greg. Has high gate speed. I think Cash and Flow, who's got barrier one, would cop a sit on him. And that would put Let It Ride for Tim Butt three deep on the marker pegs. That would seem logical. I spoke to Natalie this week about this. Natalie is going to drive Mark and Natalie's horses through the heats. Then they'll decide on the final. She made a really good point. She said, if you draw well, you have to take advantage of it. Yes. Because you will get beat in some heat somewhere. You will have bad luck. So when you have good luck... With the draw, you need to take advantage of it. So I, Cruz Bromack will be leading. I read that as it. I'm going forward, I'm going to try and lead this race, and I think Luke McCarthy on cash and flow is smart enough to go, well, if I pid, let it ride three deep, I'll probably run second. Real Stride was really good at Manangle last time. It's in play, but I'll be surprised if cash and flow doesn't win that because um, the Purden Rasmussen horses went across earlier than the other horses. Speeding Spur went today. They went last Saturday. So they've had plenty of time to settle in. And they're actually staying um, where Blacks of Fake used to stay. Because Blacks of Fake won for Natalie, the last Inter-Dominion held in Victoria in 2008, back at the Valley. Remember that when they had harness racing back at the Valley? Here's the, here's the, uh, the market. Tiger Tara, uh, $4.50 uh, heads it up. But you can find the one you like, basically, can't you? Look, you can. It's, that, it's an open series. I'm not taking 4.5 for him because that's just way too short. If he draws two in the final when he's in top form, he might be a buck 80. I don't yeah. know. San Carlo and Shadow Sacks are comparable horses, although slightly different horses. Cruz Bromax and play very seriously. Rapper's Delight's very quick off the gate. Um, he's been racing really strong. He's a chance. Let It Ride's been OK at Menangle, but not as good as it was earlier in the winter, for example, and won the Blacks of Fake. Pat's Delight, you know. Frank and Nelson, you know. Spank him, you know. The rest of them, to be perfectly honest, have no chance. But there's enough there, Greg, that it's worth watching and it's going to be interesting. And I think for a lot of New Zealanders, if we win a heat, they'll be more interested if we're there. It'll heat. build momentum. Exactly. I think the Franco Nelson Shadow Sacks heat, a lot of Kiwis will go, well, I don't really care about that. Yes. But I do think that first heat with Tiger Tar and Spank him and Pat's Delight people will want to watch. Or if you don't want to watch it, We'll show you all the replays on the show here next week. Yeah, what about the Trotters? Uh, let's have a look at heat number one. Wilma's mate, you've already touched on Tim, but training while it's on this campaign. Alderbeck's there, Tornado Valley we know very well and is the favourite for the series. Yeah, he is, former New Zealander, now with, uh, with Andy Gath, and he's been flying over there. He has very high gate speed. It's quite a quick front line here. The two's a good horse, tough monarch, and so save our pennies. And then off the second line is Kai Valley Bluer, who ran second in the Dominion just a week and a half ago. So... That, that's a good heat. Um, the Trotters, Mark Cooler would add a lot of lustre to it, but, you know, it's not missing. Speeding Spurs probably our best trotter after Mark Cooler, and their best, best ones are Kai Valley Blur and, and Tornado Valley. So Speeding Spurs in the next heat, and he's got a perfect barrier Hasn't draw. He? It's not a strong heat. Maori Law is a good up and coming horse, but has no real open class form. Horse on the inside of the second line, Rompers Monarchy's a pretty good horse. So if you're playing into this, Monty Python's probably in play, but uh, Josh and John are happy with speeding Spur. Um, he heads across today. See King Denny there as well, the yep, uh, two John Jules Derby winner. and Jules yep. winner. So look, there's enough there. You may, you may not like it that much. Here's the market for the final. That's ridiculous. Tornado Valley being 2.3. Um, that's a no betting market. There's nothing there you want to play into if you like to bet sensibly. So here's a question for you. Are you going to watch? Definitely. Yeah, okay. I'll be watching. It actually starts quite early. The good thing is they run the heats back to back. So I think the first heat 
New Zealand times about nine o'clock. Yeah, so once night. it gets on a roll, so once it gets on a roll, you can watch the five, five, and, five in a row. Uh, yeah. And then they go next Tuesday to the Rat over seventeen thirty, which will be interesting. But I would say be very cautious. You don't want to be backing horses coming from back in the field. You want to be backing leaders. And then next Wednesday, we'll give you a rundown on what's happened so far in case you do miss some of the heats. But yeah, um, talking about them, the Dominion Champions. What about you this got a book? But, um, there's not many harness racing books written. I grew up reading everyone I get my hands on. Salute to Trotting and all those great books over there. Flying Sulkies, which is um, a great book. Here's a new one. This is our mate Smolder about, as you probably guess, Smolder, who won the Inter Dominion in 2016. And it's a different type of book. It's written by Marcus Kirkwood, who part owns Smolder. And it's dedicated to his son, Tom, who, who passed away. Uh, and Mark Purden would often wear... Uh, my mate Tom name on, on the colours on, sleeve, yeah. on the colours for Smolder. It's it's a, a different book because it's written other people's perspectives and what they got out of Smolder's career. Now, if you're a harness racing person or there's someone in your family who's a harness racing person, Good I'm going to show you. Present, it's actually pretty cool. Um, and there's yeah, there's some pictures in there too. But the stories are really interesting. It's about how other people's lives were affected by what Smolder did. Not the horse, but the people they met through it and. And it's quite interesting about how a horse and its journey affects other people and what they take out of it and the friendships they make. And Neil Pilcher, of course, the late Neil Pilcher's mentioned there um, extensively. And um, we're going to show you a graphic of where you can order this because it's a self-published book. And as you said, Greg, it's the sort of thing, I think a harness racing people are, are poorly off for books these days. They don't have many books they can buy. So it's, it's a Christmas present for somebody who wants to see the effect these good horses have on other people's lives. And it's quite an emotional story, obviously, because of Tom. So we've got a graphic there somewhere. Have we? Yeah, we, yeah we have. Yep, you, you'll be able to... Oh, we're already showing it. So I've, already I've shown it. watching. I was looking at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> can we show it again, Red uh, Brand? We yes. It. Yeah. So I've always wanted it's to do that thing. Is that can it? you do that? Is no? that you? Oh, there it is. The Purchase your copy. Here it is. There, there it is. Okay. Amatesmolder.com.au slash product. Yeah. So you can Excellent. buy that. And I don't think it's pretty expensive, but um, have you read it? Oh, I'm halfway through it, actually. Yeah. So on the plane on the way have, here. Have you read the chapters about you? Because it's a chapter about no, you, isn't I it? see you're in there as well. No. So. Have you read the chapter about yourself, didn't you? Mm. you did. I was quite happy with it. Mm. Yeah. Ultimate mm. Machete? Interesting story about Ultimate Machete. Auckland Cup Market's open, pre-noms, and well done to the TRB for opening a market pre-noms. Yep. Because the noms close on Friday at 11 o'clock for the Auckland Cup and the National Trot. Here's the problem. And I'm not trying to be negative, Gregory, but I'm trying to be sensible. Here's the market for the Auckland Cup, and there's no ultimate machete listed in here. There's no Star Galleria. And how can you bid into this if they're not in the market? Now, if ultimate machete's on the water walker, and he's now coming back into work, and I spoke to Natalie, and she said, I think he'll make it. I think. And Star Galleria, after the epiglottis entrapment operation, is back at Stephen Reed's and jogging up, and they are setting him for the Auckland Cup. Now, I know it's really hard to pre-frame a market before noms, and that market will have to close and reopen with them once they're nominated, but... They should be thought, in there. Well, they should yeah. be in there. And, and it's hard, Greg, to bet into that market with any confidence, because if you back the fixer at $4, and ultimately the shitty beats him, you lose your money. But you didn't have the option to back him now. So my advice to the tab would be close that market till Friday morning, because as it is, it doesn't make enough sense to me. That's my opinion. I just want to flip back to Australia quickly. Uh, an old mate of ours, Buster Brady, has been doing the business in his last couple of starts. This was an outstanding performance because he's at park for most of this, winning the Geelong Cup. And the hopple's back on too. That's Cash and Flow finishing third. Now, this is a good story. This is young Kima Frenning, who came out from Sweden to work as a stable hand and a Monty rider. And we'll talk about the Monty's later on. And... She rode in the Montes, and obviously was a talented horse person, as so many of the Swedes are, started to drive in races, and people were sort of like, oh, this is kind of cute, Kim is driving in races, that's really nice, because she's, she's just the nicest girl. A very similar personality to Sheree Thomas, a very happy person. And she started driving in races, and now she's training Buster Brady, first of all she's trained, and she's driving Rapper's Delight in the Inter-Dominion. So those pathways, the obvious pathway we think about Greg is kids of cards, but what a lot of people who will criticise the Monty this Friday night, and there will be people who criticise it, won't realise is, is that it's also a different pathway. There's other people who might get into the industry via Monty's and end up in the chemophrenic situation. So um, she's a success for the Monty's, but uh, a very likeable young lady, one of the faces of the Sinter Dominion, and on a horse in Rapper's Delight who can win it. As for Buster Brady, he's not going to the series, but 
and what we saw there, mm. he's going to have a stack he's of fun. He's going to have a whole lot of fun. Of was developed in New Zealand by uh, Kyle Austin. We're about to take a break on your box seat. When we return, we'll catch up with Andrew Seabrook from New Zealand Bloodstock Standerbury. You're in the box seat, and as we mentioned before we went to the break, uh, this man here went out and caught up uh, with the head of NZ Bloodstock Standard Bread, Andrew Seabrook, to update us as to where they're at, particularly with a view towards the upcoming sales. Well, Andrew, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread has been around now for a few months. How have you found the integration into harness racing? It's been uh, surprisingly uh, gone really well. It's um, gone far better than I'd hoped. We'd been under sort of pressure, or not really pressure, but people were recommending that we come into the game probably over the last 12 to 18 months, and we finally took the leap of faith uh, some a few months ago, and it's been fantastic, Michael. The, the support, the feedback, the comments from, from Bluff to Kai Tai has, has been amazing, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. Andrew, NZB on the thoroughbred side is a huge international business. Why would you bother getting into something a lot smaller like harness racing? Well, we wanted to d diversify. Uh, we saw an opportunity there. We didn't think the sales were being marketed fantastically, not just domestically, but internationally. I mean, the New Zealand uh, harness horse, just uh, the, on the international stage, is quite incredible. You look at the statistics in Australia at the moment. I think we won 32% of the Group 1 races last season, 41% of all stakes races in Australia. Some of the statistics are amazing. I didn't appreciate that until the time. Um, but it's, it, I think we can get more Australians, more a greater export dollar um, being spent here. Um, New Zealand Bloodstock specialises in selling horse, and I think we can just help take it to another level. With the NZB machine behind the standard breed industry, I, I think we can increase the returns to vendors and breeders. And um, I'm really excited from what I've seen so far, Michael. I'm really confident about the future. You talk about appreciation for the harness racing industry. You've just come back from your first New Zealand Cup week at Addington, so experiencing New Zealand Cup Day. Um, how did you find that? Absolutely brilliant. On the Monday night beforehand, we had a, a media night uh, with various uh, media personalities from Australia and New Zealand, which was fantastic, and already we've seen good results from that. And Tuesday was, was a great day, my first ever Addington meeting. Um, the crowd, the atmosphere, I thought the service, the food, and I love my food, Michael, geez, it was good. Um, just everything about, I was in the Blanc de Blanc lawn down the lawn. Actually, I must send uh, Kieran a message at the Addington uh, Raceway. It was just fantastic. I really, really loved the day. Uh, we looked after 10 Australians um, who are most appreciative of our hospitality, and they'd come from Perth and, and Melbourne and Sydney to be with us for the day, and uh, uh, just very encouraging talking to them and just being involved with the whole day was great. You are new kids on the block. Um, how's the response been from the vendors and the breeders? It's been brilliant. Um, I think anyone could have come in at the time and people would have been happy, but um, beyond my wildest dreams. I've been as far as south as uh, Invercargill, uh, visiting clients. In fact, when we announced um, the decision to enter the game, Michael, I rang about 20 or 30 of the larger uh, players in the game and the response was amazing and it's continued to be that way. I think they're just starting to see now what we can do and uh, we sent out a, a really cool um, electronic vendor email a couple of weeks ago just explaining what we're up to. Uh, we're about to do the same with the buyers all around the world tomorrow. Um, I'll send you a copy actually, so, which up just tells everyone how good the New Zealand horse is and what they can experience when they come to Karaka and to Christchurch and as I said before the statistics, geez we've just got to get those out there, they're, they're amazing. The sales in recent years have gone through patches of feeling flat and or stale. What innovation can NZBS bring to it? I think uh, from what I've heard the credit facilities weren't fantastic at the sales this year and a lot of people were hamstrung either having to pay on the day or, or, or having to pay pretty quickly. Um, that won't happen with us. Um, our, our credit criteria will be more lenient um, than the previous outfit and we've introduced a two-year-old sale um, which we're hoping to encourage pin hooking from the yearling sales to two-year-olds and also pin hooking from weanlings to yearlings. We think we can grow that weanling market. Uh, that's something that's really happened in the game, the pin hooking from wheelings to yearlings and yearlings to two year old has been a big part of our success. Uh, but you talk about innovation, um, in fact I'll announce it now Michael that uh, we're going to start Gavel House for standard breeds um, and that's been a great success for us. 
tell us more about that. So you're going to have the opportunity for people who, who want to move horses on to go to an electronic marketplace? Yeah, so two years ago we, we, we bought the subsidiary Gavel House, which was just a, a listed uh, site at the time, advertising site. We've turned it into a, a commercial auction, live auction site. We have two auctions uh, a fortnight. Um, in the last 12 months, Michael, we've sold, uh, we've offered 1,050 horses, sold about 700 horses for $3 million. Um, it's, it's amazing how it's been accepted by our thoroughbred uh, clients. They all love it. And I, I can't see uh, any reason why it won't be a success in the, for, for the standard breeds. It, it, it allows an opportunity for people to sell horses at, at any stage throughout the year, uh, to break partnerships, to, to get rid of horses they don't want, or, or even to, to, to sell decent horses. We've sold horses on the thoroughbred uh, Gavel House website for up to $200,000. Um, I think it's I think it's really exciting. Of course, it saves floating horses to sales and all that sort of thing. We only had there's only two or three standard bred sales throughout the year live auctions. So I think providing this online opportunity at very reasonable rates too, I might add, um, is going to be quite exciting. Australia is very important. The US seems to have woken from its dormancy. How important is the international market, and how do you guys tap into it better? It's been incredibly important for us, for the thoroughbred since 1927, uh, because of our weak domestic market. And I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be the same with the standard breed. Um, although the standard breed harness game is racing, is, could, you could argue is going possibly better than the thoroughbreds. But it's get into Australia. So James Jennings, my 2IC, and Peter Lagan, the, the manager of the division, are going off to Australia next week. They'll go to Sydney, they'll go to Melbourne, and they're going to Perth to host um, what we call, call a cocktail tour. They'll be ha um, going to track work, have, sponsoring, having um, breakfasts, lunches, dinners. Um, we believe in direct marketing, one-on-one, -on -one, developing relationships, and making those connections with people. Um, I think that's the best form of spend for a marketing dollar. So we'll be a putting a lot of time and resources into um, going to Australia one-on-one -on -one marketing. The same will happen with, with the United States. Um, probably more the states are obviously into the tried market. It's, it's probably hard for them, uh, hard to convince them to come down and buy some of the hemisphere bred yearlings at this time, but um, it's definitely a market. And with the success of uh, two or three horses we've had up there in recent months, um, we need to strike while the iron's hot. How confident are you that inside six months or a year or whatever the business plan is that NZBS will have a positive impact on the harness racing trickling down right through the entire industry? I'm really confident that the 2020 sales will be qu quite a significant increase. Um, next year I'm hopeful. We're doing everything we can. Uh, we've concentrated on the first few months on getting the vendors and breeders on side and getting our database sorted. We've now got the pedigree database all sorted as well, so we're all set to go there. Um, we've just launched a new website over the next six months people will actually have the ability to go online themselves and print out their own pedigree. Now that's never been available in New Zealand. Um, so it's like with the thoroughbreds with Arian, you can just go on, print off a race form of a horse, print off a proper pedigree page that you see in the catalogue, so we'll be able to do that. Um, so, But I think, um, I'd like to think that our, our efforts over the next two months are going to pay dividends for the February 2019 yearling sales. So that was Andrew Seabrook. Um, interesting, wouldn't be bad luck to get on that. Whole lot of lunches and breakfast by the sound of it. Last thing I need, Gregory, after a couple of weeks is to be <laughs> participating in lunches and breakfast of anybody on the drink. A um, couple of really crucial factors there. The credit facility is a good one. Um, you don't want to go crazy on it, but for a young trainer, if you want to go buy a horse at the weaning sale and take it to the yearling sale, or vice versa, the yearling sale and take it to the two-year-olds in training sale, that's a real pathway for these young guys and girls because if they can get credit to do that, and secondly, um, the Gavel House thing, that's interesting. Now, Gavel House is an online platform, but it's quite a well-established one where they sell gallopers on. As of today, they're going to start selling harness horses on it. And you can up... I think that'll really work. Well, the Australians love buying our horses, and it's simple if they can get on a website, you're sitting there at night, you look playing on your phone, you like the look of a horse, you go back, you can link to Harness Racing New Zealand, look at all its performances, and then you buy it with a flat fee of 5%. Mm. Now, some people would say that takes agents out of play, but a lot of people are still going to want to ring their agent and say, what do you make of this horse? But then you get a chance to bid on it. Now, if you've got a horse, Greg, which you don't want anymore, but you haven't got a specific buyer for in that $10,000, dollars 20000 range, this is perfect. Mm. Perfect. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and, and people can buy them in the North Island or wherever, and I think that's a real step in the right direction. I also think it's important that as an industry we don't belittle what Pine Gorgonis Wrightson did.
for the industry. They have done an enormous amount. I've got an update. Exactly. So, so yeah. you've spoken so to So I them. spoke to Cameron Grant, who's the South Island representative. I didn't think I'd find too many golfers in the sport that were actually on a lower handicap than me. But he's, he's, a, he's a plus he's one. He's a plus one, I think. So that's pretty staggering. Anyway, uh, more about that another time. But uh, I, I talked to him. So he's the South Island man. I said, so what's the plans? He said, we will be honouring the sales series and their commitment to those series over the next two years. So that's one thing that I, I wasn't aware of, but obviously that's what they have to do because the horses have gone through the sales and therefore payments for two and three. Yeah. So that, that'll all still be happening. Um, I got the impression from him that they could become an online option. Now, mm -hmm. whether that's as a mixed sale or a, um, you know an, an all-age sale, whatever, they are more likely to go down that path he didn't say they wouldn't be having a sale in the future, but I doubt it'll ever be to the extent what they had in the past. Well, it's impossible. There's only well, so it just many, won't happen. There's only yeah. so many horses in the game. And as I said, we can't belittle what Pine Gorgon writes and did. I just think they stopped putting resource into this arm of the individual, this division of their business, and I think it's the right time for NZB to take over. And, and Andrew's a pretty smart guy. They did their research beforehand. They have some innovations coming in. I think the credit one's huge for people, and I wish them the best of luck. I think it can only be good. Talking about yearling sales, there's not many hotter families in harness racing than, than this mum here. This is Reality Check, who I shouldn't like because she actually bet a horse I owned once in a yes. sale series race, <laughs> which still begrudged me, but she's turned into a wonderful mare. Dam of Ultimate Machete and Ultimate Sniper. There's a little bubba by Art Major, so an Art Major half. And as you can see, obviously not that old. Um, what, a, what a meat it is. Look at the size of it, Gregory. Yeah, exactly. So that's for ultimate breeding. And if you're out there and you've got a mare at home who's got a nice foal at foot and you've got a nice picture, if you're an Insta person, um, chuck it to us because yep. we love that sort of stuff. Yep, we certainly do. We're about to take a short break uh, for us. When we return, we're heading stateside and find out what Dexter Dunn's been up to. In your home straight in your box seat, we've got to head stateside now, Michael, because uh, Dexter Dunn uh, was winning a rather big race in the wet. Yep, the this is that. one of the TVG finals. This is the Meadowlands last Saturday night, New Zealand time, and these are big deal. These are their sort of season enders, and this one's trained by Nifty Norman, so we all know Richard, um, and here he is, Dexter, with the biggest win he's had stateside for the Trotters, and 420 odd thousand dollars. Long odds too, wasn't it? it was, wasn't yep. one of the favourites, about 18 or 19. And Nifty's always been a good trainer. A yes. couple of years ago, he had the best trotting mare in the US, and um, Dexter, I, I had a good catch up with Dexter when I was in New Jersey and he's driving a lot. I said, what do you, you know, do you miss home? He said, look, I'm so busy, I don't think about it much. He said, I will miss New Zealand Cup time, but he's driving a lot of horses, a lot of them at Chester, um, which is one well, of the smaller tracks, but he drives a lot of the Meadowlands now. That was a big meeting. Their TVGs, sort of like our jewels, but for all ages of horses. The next horse you'll know, McWicked, of course, the McWicked. rival of Lazarus, here he is. Um, down the outside, second over as they call it, and he's just too good. When you see how dominant he is, Greg, over the other free for allers, then you realise what a great job Lazarus did to beat him twice. Like he just dominates. He'll win US Horse of the Year. The other horse who's in play for US Horse of the Year is the New Zealand Red Shatin. Here she is, and this is taking her past a million for the season, winning the big Mears race. and. Look, she led and she was way too good and congratulations once again to her New Zealand connections who bred her here and um, she's had an amazing, amazing season, Greg. We haven't seen enough of her and it wasn't much of a night to be completely honest but Mick Wicked franked the Lazarus form, Dexter Dunn got a win, Sha Tin, excellent there, lots for New Zealand to be proud of on TVG finals night at the Meadowlands. Back on the home front, well, it wasn't as wet as what it was at the Meadowlands. Uh, well, maybe it was, <laughs> because this would say and show you that it was uh, fun at the beach. Wasn't at a beach, but he was doing the business. 
And so often horses come out of Cup Week, Greg, and they go back to a semi-normal graded race and they win. He's a decent horse, of course. Um, Air Park Fly, excellent in second race, robbed of some depth by Ultra Maestro and Forgotten Highway being scratched. Of course, Forgotten Highway will go to the Green Mile. Um, one day of. Yeah, a Bell Sun having a win there. Won that the was trot, fantastic. And I don't think he'd won a race he had won for a couple two, of years. two years ago, mm. the same race, and, and he, was, he was very brave. So... Um, Kieran Tomlinson, by the way, drove Amarito's son of that race looking for a first win. Did nothing wrong. She no. couldn't do more than she Finished did. Finished third. The only thing wrong yeah. with that was? It was you picked it. Me picked it. So, no, yeah, poor Kieran. It's, it's his fault. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Williamson won the uh, driver's series down south. He is Majestic Man winning, who you would have thought would have won the way he went at Cup Week. And, um, of course, uh, they won the series. So it was a, a dominant victory for the Southerners. Yep. And Nathan's a top-class driver. This is a good horse. He went up in open class. One would think, again, follow form out of Cup Week, winning form, second form, doesn't matter. There they all are, the Woodlands sponsored series. And I think they enjoy it, the boys and girls, when they get a chance to get together and have a beer and go somewhere different and do something a bit different and drive course, horses for different states. The Brothers in Arms series is at Oamaru, but it's not on the grass because we've had a lot of rain, so it's on the all-weather. That's mm. on Saturday, eh? Yeah, it is. Yep, cool. definitely is. Uh, we've got a few other things you need to have a look at. A dead heat at the Mott on uh, Sunday. This is a bizarre yeah, story. Well, well bizarre. I'm, I'm picking that, well, it's never happened before, surely. Sisters? Twin sisters. Dead heating. Twin sisters. On the grass. Cheryl and Cherie Wig. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dead heating in an amateur driver's race. And it's cool. It, it's it's a, amateur driving racing is amateur driving racing. But the chances of this actually happening, yeah. I don't know what they are. They are enormous. I've got one story which is relatively close to this. In the Kamara Gold Nuggets about 30 years ago, Tom Lawler and Jimmy Lawler, who are brothers, trained horses who dead heated in the Kamara Gold Nuggets, hmm. which is also pretty bizarre. Um, I can't remember their names because I was about 12. But, <laughs> but anyway, it, it happened. But well done to Cherie and Cheryl because this is... They've had a lot of success in a very short Rungle time. Rungle and Queen of Glory were the two horses, yeah. so yeah. But cool that, that's, that's a cool photo for the wall at home. Here's a training success. Bubblegum, Andrew Drake, who I think at one stage was working for the Wizard, Todd Mitchell. Uh, he got his first training success there at the Manawatu. Good young fella. Likeable young fella. And the first win's always important for anybody. So well done, Andrew. You're on the board. May you have a thousand more. Yeah. Well, that's a nice win uh, for him. Uh, Kieran McNaught had his uh, first driving win as well. Always a, a pretty big moment, as we see uh, Andrew Drake there and uh, Bubblegum, who was formerly trained out of the Brendan Hill team. But here's Andrew. Uh, uh, sorry, here's Kieran McNaught uh, getting the business done here with uh, El De Niro. The outside from the Nighthawk who fights hard on the inside. El De Niro doing a little bit the better. El De Niro, the Nighthawk. El Capitan got into third with a good So congratulations to you, uh, Kieran. Now, the week before the Cup Carnival, there was success uh, by a horse called Superfast Pat, and the name would suggest Did you see Ginger it? Woodhouse. At one, at did one did we see it? Metres. Here it is. We thought we'd better show it, because here it is. You talk about cricket pitches, this was about three of them. And it subsequently came out of one again, yeah, and yes. when it won the second time, you've never seen a horse more held on to to win. It was quite remarkable. So it's won there by three cricket pitches. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's, we actually had two of them. Missy Moo did the same thing a week earlier. A week before. Yeah, so super here it fast is, Pat. Super Fast Pat. Um, that's it winning by 30 and a half lengths. And the week before, the winner won by 23 and three quarter lengths. Missy Moo, as you just mentioned. And it then came out and won the following start and it was absolutely strangled to hold so here's on. Missy. Here's Missy Moo. <laughs> and the funny thing about it is when you watch this right and Missy Moo wins, you go, well, the things behind it must be useless. <laughs> and then super fast Pat comes out, wins by 30 lengths. So just never give up. Sometimes they take a while to click on them. Super fast Pat has clicked on and it'll be having a fun time around that circuit they have around Southland over Christmas, which is one of my hey, favourites. And speaking it's of fun. Southland, I caught up with Jason Broad the other day. They are always looking to do innovative things down there and they've, they, those nugget finals have really, they've actually got super nugget finals now they've been so successful down there uh, they're trialling online nominations he said oh, oh, the, a race meeting he can get a couple of hundred phone calls over a period of a day with people. He said it's taking too much time, so they're going to trial the online nom so on a Sunday night. The trainers can sit there and bang them out and send them through, and um, we'll save a bit of time. I, I, I like I, the innovation. I like it, but i tell you what we have to get to is the ability to give all owners a code. 
and you have a code, much like your PIN code, where you can withdraw whatever sort of money you want out of your bank. And if you want to sign over or buy a share in a horse or all that sort of stuff, you can do it on your phone with your code. Because you can transfer $250,000 out of your mortgage with a code on your phone, anytime you want. But if you want to buy a horse, and I want to buy a horse with you, we want to race it together, I've got to sign the papers, print them, send them to you. It get is the biggest yeah. stuff around in the world. It is. And if that's one thing we could get right, where you have a code, because as I said, you can buy a house or a car, you can buy a private jet if you've got enough money, <laughs> with your PIN code, and yet we have to stuff around with these signatures all the time for horses. Gee, I'd love to see that fixed. Right about the racing ahead, like the idea of Michael uh, this week, Fulbury Park, $40,000 fast track insurance, pick six there, eight races, adding to nine races, uh, McMillan Equine Feed, Sire Stakes Silver, we'll talk about that surely, and an Alabar Sire Stakes Heat uh, to boot. Alongside that will be Alexandra Park, a turbo pick six, 40 grand between Addington and Auckland. Awamaru, that's the Brothers at Arms uh, series there, 10 races, 12-12 the kickoff, and it's Green Mile Day there, $5,000 bonus early quaddy as part of the day, 12 o'clock, 11 races there. Let's preview some of the racing upcoming, Michael, because um, I think there's a few that we can get involved in here, the first uh, of those. I think we need to have a look at Wainui Creek. A couple of us are going to be Park tipping this uh, on uh, as part of our tips for the week. Here's Wainui Creek and here's Pat's Dragon who's won three of four. I'm going to sound this up because this was the week after Cup weekend. Mark Mack had clearly lost the plot. Domination anytime third then Johnny Mack but it's Wainui Creek and the man they call the turtle. Out by two, two and a half on any time. Global domination. Look at the smoke coming off. Pat's Dragon roaring down the outside but it's Wainui Creek. Wainui Creek win it by length on Pat's Dragon any time. Trailer Park Girl. Yeah, so Wainui Creek uh, goes around in race number eight. Mark Mack did say at the end of that commentary, never again. And I agree with him. He shouldn't try that again. I think he should try different things in life. <laughs> <laughs> he clearly uh, I'm not sure I'll that. be trying that. But, um, and then we head from there. So that, that, Size stake silver. That's a good, yeah, they're good races. Good they race. could support races. There's obviously one for the boys and one for the girls. Um, stars tonight obviously raced against the big boys, Ultimate Sniper and Cohen. He ran fifth on this occasion. Probably Just ahead of him was the horse that will probably be favourite for this. Mighty. I thought Stars Delight might start favourite over him. Mighty flying up. Yeah. yeah, OK. And I'd love to see Brownie win it with, with the horse he runs fourth here. So, but they're good consolations. They're a good idea. I think the size stakes and sales series will get little boosts under NB, uh, NZBS, to be honest, but they're ones this weekend. Green Mile. Green Mile. I, I like Miles. one. I yeah. like one here. I, I don't often bet on the grass. I'll be backing here. Forgotten Highway. Not worried about missing the race last week. If it can stay in front of AG's White Sox and spend the night together, who come out of a New Zealand Cup, as does Forgotten Highway. But second on the grass to Cruz Bromac in the Methford Cup. This writes itself. He is beautifully placed. Here he is second from the outside. Now, Cruz Bromac comes off his back, but Cruz Bromac's one of the favourites for the Interdom. And I'll be perfectly honest, AG's White Sox was better in the New Zealand Cup, but he's been struggling, Greg. He did win this race last year. Agreed, he did. I think this is a great bet, Forgotten Highway. And, um, he beats Star Galleria and Ultimate Machete. Machete. So that writes itself. In the Green Mile, Trot Mar Cooler, as we heard, is not going to be. The Finney's going to Auckland for the Lyle Creek and the National Trot. Uh, and then that gets us to this bunch of horses. And everybody knows won this race last year, but he had a good barrier draw on that occasion. He doesn't hear. Again, I'm not a huge grass punter. I think this race sets up beautifully for Ronald J. Yeah, I agree. If he stays in front of the six and the seven, he should win. Yep, here's uh, the Dominion Mark. that we were talking about. There's everybody knows in the middle, Ricky May with the uh, gold cap there, never gets out. Got stuck up in traffic there. Obviously Mark Caller was off and gone, but he had a bit to offer. Well, no doubt he can win the race again. It is very much a horses for courses place method, but he doesn't have the same barrier draw this week, which makes his task a little bit harder. I just think Ronald J might have the opportunity to stay in front of him. And if he does that, it's going to be awfully hard to run him down. But yeah, Mark Cooler, as we said, coming to Auckland, where we are absolutely certain Clint Ford will be driving. Yes, he will be in the Lyle Creek and then on to the National Trot. And of course, he's got the Cambridge options uh, as well. No, about the Woodlands not the Cambridge. No, no OK. So okay. he's not going there. Cool. Uh, Wainui Creek's one of the Woodlands runners. Whips and Spurs, uh, son of a tiger, goes round at Addington. Looks pretty talented tight too. So... Uh, 
there's what's running for Woodlands. What about the betting update? Finally, our good friend uh, Glenn Bourne has come up with this. This is where things sit at the moment. Of course, this will run through until Christmas time, then we'll reevaluate how what we're doing with it. Um, Let's talk about Aaron. We love Aaron. He's a great commentator. He's our friend, but he's minus 600. Mm. Aaron? You need to lift your game. You need to lift your game, Aaron. Mm. Seriously. Okay. Otherwise, it's going to be an intervention, and you won't be welcome back after Christmas. Now, Mark Mack uh, has found himself in the top three, alongside Which is a tremendous Cameron J. Shaw and Michael Guerin. Mm. Um, speaking about Mark Mack, here he is. This is, this is truly disturbing, the footage. This is, if you have children, don't let them watch this. this is... Well, you think that's disturbing. Um, I'm being stitched up here. You, know, you are about, being stitched, stitched up here. Stitched up here. Um, what have you done there? You didn't know this was going to happen, oh. but... Here he is in our control room, none other than Mickey G. <laughs> Look at you, Bob. That's actually how I dance in real life. Mm, I have seen this. H had this been a real chicken version of me, it would have been pouting more. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder why we weren't going out on the Mark Mac one. Now I see why. There'll well, be paybacks for this. Yeah, Red Brand, that was him. I can guarantee you that, Glenn Bourne. Right, here's the bets this week. This is concerning. Matt Cross has gone uh, the same as I have. And you might say to me, oh, why are you tipping Wine Erie Creek? It'd be $1.50. I need a run on the board. I need a run on the board. So I think uh, she's very talented. Uh, so Wine Erie Creek has to carry you and Matt Cross. And Ricky That's May. a lot of stupidity for one Yeah, Ricky May's got barrier one. For there one horse. Uh, Mr Yips has to carry the big fish and the 12 year old. So there you mm. go. And uh, Errol Rich has gone with sex on fire. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I won't say anything about that. No. Mm. Very good. Uh, the box seat in the next month, here is a bit of an update for you. Slightly late on the 19th, that's due to some races at Forbury Park that night. Boxing Day we will not have a show, but we will have a special preview and the big fish, Craig Thompson, will be in with you and I on the eve of the Auckland Cup. So uh, that'll be a preview that night, I assume at 8.30. Um, and then we'll have uh, the Auckland Cup meeting, which is in the afternoon, and we'll wrap that up two days later, which will basically be a review of that, and let's talk about what's ahead uh, uh, as we take a three-week break. Yep, and if you can't be stuffed watching Into the Minions, uh, tune in next Wednesday because we'll show you everything you need to know and give you opinions on them because that's pretty much what we do. All right, that is uh, your box seat for the week. You don't get a dancing chicken? Uh, no dancing chicken for me. John Hay, milestone birthday today too. I'm not going to tell you how old I like John. He's, I don't si want he's him 60. To not like me. John's 60. Uh, very good. Good evening to you all.